What's up everybody, my name is Zach Redrow and you're listening to the It's Not A Phase podcast. On this episode I'm joined by Jamie Otzer, a music publicist and the director of Wall of Sound PR. We talk about what a music publicist is and does, his unconventional route of getting into music publicity, how you can get involved in publicity yourself, what bands should consider and expect from a PR campaign and loads more. Before we get started, let's go off the boring stuff. If you enjoy this episode and would like to support the podcast, please consider subscribing, rating, and leaving a review wherever you're listening to this. We also have a Patreon, where everyone gets access to each episode a week earlier than everyone else, a Discord community, and a merch store too. You can also follow and reach out to me on social media. All the links can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. And with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this week's episode of It's Not A Phase. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episode of It's Not A Phase, where I'm joined by Jamie Otzer, the director, founder of Wall of Sound PR. How are you doing, man? I'm very well, thank you. I was just saying it's been uh, a long time we've been speaking, for about 10 years, haven't we? So it's yeah. really nice to finally actually chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm actually, well, not meeting face-to-face, but e-meet, so... Uh, yeah, the best thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially in this day and age with uh, COVID and stuff, so... yeah. So we'll just get the, the foundations of obviously who you are and what you do. So you're a publicist, you own uh, and founded your own publicity firm, Wall of Sound. For those people who are listening and don't know quite what a publicist is and what you do, can you kind of just summarize what that is? Yeah. So, I mean, basically in the simplest sense, I, I just liaise between, you know, clients and the media, really. You know, I mean, obviously <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that but what we are sort of there for is to provide a sort of focal point for our clients um when they're speaking to you know the press or uh, the media broadcast or or tv or radio um and just sort of help them to communicate their message really you know i mean and that can you know that can range from anything i mean obviously you know we work with a lot of bands but we've worked with like brands and events and um just like sort of personalities before you know what really it's kind of just helping to put stories in the hands of of journalists and broadcasters and help those stories be told and to hopefully kind of obviously raise the profile of whatever it is that we're working on essentially so yeah I mean in a nutshell that's it really and what kind of is like the the average day for you in in terms of your your day-to-day job of being a publicist and when it comes to attracting and maintaining existing clients how does that kind of look how how do you go about doing that um well in terms of kind of uh i'll answer the second question first in terms of sort of maintaining or attracting clients you may i like to think we maintain them by just doing a good job really you know what i mean it's sort of you know obviously i was just chatting to someone actually on on the previous meeting uh, about this but where our company is located in terms of sort of like the hierarchy, if you like, is that obviously we work with a lot of emerging and unsigned artists. So there's a natural proportion of those bands, which will sort of progress to the next level of the industry, if you like, you know, so, I mean, we are in it for kind of establishing long-term relationships with our clients, but obviously it will be sometimes a band will get to a certain point and like, sony will come in or universal or whoever and they'll go oh we're signing this band and like we've got our own in-house publicist or you know we've got an existing relationship with someone else so obviously you know sometimes you lose clients in that regard but yeah i sort of see that as just a reflection on the fact that we've done a good job with with growing them to that stage really you know and i think it, it speaks volumes when you look at the amount of bands we've worked with that have gone on to do really well is you know we're obviously picking the right ones <laughs> you know um so obviously yeah you you know you lose some clients in that regard but i mean in general we've got quite a good retention rate and um like i say you know i just think it's by being open and transparent with our communication with our clients and and working hard you know we we try and do the best job we can and you know we've got a good reputation and in terms of attracting new clients you know i would say almost all if not all of our business comes from recommendation so i don't really it's quite rare that we like go out and find bands. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. sometimes me or Lee will kind of like hear something or see a band and email them and be like, if you're ever looking for PR, like we really love the band and we'd love to work with you. But in general, you find, <laughs> to be honest, you normally find people quite like 
hesitant about that because you know you you know bands have often been like burnt by bad experiences with like shady people in the industry yeah. before so they're a bit sort of wary when you reach out to them but you know most of our new clients come through either labels that we already work with or it'll be like bands who've done campaigns with us who then someone said like oh who did you guys use and they've recommended us and yeah um or managers you know that we've that we've worked with before so yeah i mean in terms of attracting new stuff that it sort of tends to happen quite naturally you know like I, we've got a sort of contact email so anyone can send us their tunes and like we genuinely do listen to everything you know what i mean yeah. even if it's like 10 seconds and we go this is terrible <laughs> like, I, do, I do listen to every single band that emails us you know and like even if it's to be honest a lot of times sometimes people get in touch and it'll be completely wrong for us like yeah because people just don't do their research you know and they don't look at like what sort of bands we represent but we'll always listen if we think it's of a decent standard i'll always recommend you know other companies that we trust i mean you, you yourself know you know your background with um, dead press and stuff you know who the good prs are or who's trustworthy or you yeah. know so you know we've got a list of people that obviously we all talk you know all the prs talk to each other we all know each other so like i've got a list of people who i can go okay well this band are a bit too like heavy for us but like they'd be great with you know this company or you know i know like a really good like electronic publicist who'd be good for this so you know yeah. if it's not right for us we're I'm, I'm very happy to like direct people elsewhere and try and help them get a good fit because you know, myself and Lee have both got backgrounds as musicians in bands ourselves. And like, we've had bad experiences in the music industry. And like, now we're in this position, like, I just want to prevent that from happening to other people, really, you know, so yeah. if we can go like, well, I know that if we're going to put you guys with these guys instead, or we can take care of you or whatever, you know, I'd, I'd rather sort of protect artists as much as we can in that way, you know. So yeah, that's, that's sort of like, you know, a bit about sort of client base, I suppose. And then what was your other question about, about what does an average day look like? Yeah, the average day-to-day role. <laughs> well, what's in, to be honest, what's interesting, obviously, you know, it's like any other job. There's a lot of sort of sort of like menial, you know, emailing and admin tasks and all that kind of thing. But one of the great things about this job is like you don't really know what the day is going to be like until you just sit down at the desk, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes you can have like a really tough day where it's like, slow coverage day or things just aren't really going your way or you know it's kind of like everything's a bit of a slog and other days you can like send one email and land like a guardian feature for a band out of nowhere you know right or you know a few months ago you know i sort of like sent an email out to um it was just sort of reach out and see if they had anything interesting you know i was like emailed epitaph and was like oh you know just to let you guys know like we've got some space you know on the roster at the moment if you've got any bands and they sort of didn't hear back from me. i was like oh well you know that might worth worth talking to them and then like open my computer a few months ago and get an email back from them saying like oh actually we've got a few bands that we'd really like you guys to work on you know and like that's great you know what i mean when you get those kind of like moments where you've just randomly got an email from like stone gossard from pearl jam or someone and you're just yeah. like oh it's sick <laughs> it's great you know so like obviously that you know as a music fan that's exciting do you know what i mean and yeah like, that, that's the side of the job that i really love is like the unpredictability of it you know and you know equally even if it's like even just music that's super exciting you know i mean sometimes i can get an email off a band who haven't got any socials it's like their first single that they've ever recorded and you put it on and you're like holy like this is fucking amazing you know what I mean? yeah. this is like seriously good and like that's one of the things that keeps me uh addicted to doing the job really you know it's like yeah i am a, a, a music fan especially new music you know i love finding new bands and like especially bands that are doing something different that i haven't necessarily heard before or if they've got like a really important sort of message in their music that they're putting out that isn't you know necessarily being sort of sort of projected elsewhere you know and that, that's what I'm drawn to and, and they're the bands that kind of make me excited and keep me coming back and wanting to be enthusiastic about them you know yeah so yeah but I mean in terms of like a day-to-day thing it is just really like admin heavy to be honest my job I mean <laughs> obviously I do a lot of like uh we do a lot of press release drafting writing writing bios and we obviously now we do a lot of video calls and meetings speaking to press speaking to clients obviously before the pandemic it was a bit more there was a lot more traveling involved like <clears throat> i'm based up near liverpool and obviously a lot of the industry is down in london 
Um, so I'd be down in London quite a lot. Thankfully, I mean, it's double-edged sword because I like going down there, but at the same time, it's expensive. <laughs> you know, uh, when you're, you know, we're only a small company and it is expensive. It starts racking up. You know, if you're going to London a few times a month, that's a uh, few hundred quid, you know. And it's, it, you know, I do like being at home as well. It's a bit of a hassle, all the travel sometimes. So I, it's, I like it, but I'm kind of happy that I haven't had to do it that much as well, you know. So, yeah, that's it, really. I mean, you know, like the, the like I say, you know, the ins and outs of it is really like me just emailing and calling and badgering people all day about our <laughs> bands, essentially, you know. Um, so what is it? I mean, I think you kind of touched on it anyway, like obviously your love for finding and listening to new music. But what is it that made you want to get into publicity in the first place? So I actually didn't ever mean to get into publicity. <laughs> um, I didn't ever really have a clear path into like working in music in the first place you know I didn't I was one of those people who like I had no idea what I wanted to do you know like when I was in school I did like um I've always been good at like English um and you know uh writing and um but I've always been into like music and the arts as well so like I ended up my A-levels I think I did like uh, I did English art and history and I didn't know what I wanted to do and I've always been super into history as well. So I went to uni and I did archaeology at, who, at uni. So I did, oh, right, uh, okay. yeah, I did a degree in archaeology of ancient civilization. A bit different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and while I was doing my degree, I knew a couple of guys from back home who were sort of thinking about starting a new band. So there's this guy called Will uh, Bayliss, and he used to be in a band called The Famous Last Words. Um, and their drummer was Paul McCartney's nephew. Right. Okay. So they'd had like a bit of like success off the back of that. Like they did a bit of touring with like Alice Cooper and some, I can't remember, but you know, they, they'd had a little bit of success anyway. And the band had broken up and Will wanted to start a new band. So I started playing bass for them. Then we got signed by Epitaph, made an album and did some touring for a couple of years. And then as happens with a lot of bands, we basically just didn't recoup on the album and we ended up splitting up. So then I was like, okay, well, I've got no idea what I want to do for a job. The band's broken up. (laughs) I've got like a degree in archaeology, which is like half finished and like not very useful in terms of employment anyway. (laughs) Um, But what I did have was obviously loads of contacts in the music industry from touring and, you know, recording and just meeting people. So I ended up working uh, at the Barfly in Liverpool. Uh, it's actually called the Arts Club now, but it used to be owned by Mama Group. And I was like repping gigs there. So I was just sort of like night managing shows, you know, when bands were touring, I would like look after them and do all the sort of like show running for the night and make sure they were paid and all that sort of thing. Um, and then through doing that, I ended up kind of like putting shows on locally. So, we, you know, I just sort of got into like promoting gigs with uh, a friend of mine called Sean Ryman, who uh, we ended up putting a lot of shows on together and we did... Uh, a festival called Radstock as well, like a day fest, um, ended up promoting quite a lot of shows. We did a lot of shows actually. And then after that, I, I, again, it was, it was one of those things where you just sort of like fall into things through like people you meet, you know what I mean? Sort of like I was doing these shows. Um, and then through promoting, I met another promoter called Matt who owns a company called Glasswork and they're promoters as well. They do like national shows, but they had a website at the time. Um, and it used to be quite a big website. Um, it was like one of the first sort of like when Drowning Sound and stuff like that was, you know, sort of bigger back in the day. And he was looking for someone to do like two or three days a week editing the website, basically. And I was like, well, you know, I, I, I do a bit of music writing for a few other places. So I'll do that. So I started editing the website as well as promoting the shows. And then obviously through that, I kind of got an understanding of like the PR side of things, but from a writer's or editor's perspective, you know, yeah. so I was getting a lot of press releases and speaking to PRs and kind of getting more of an insight into how that side of things worked. And then after that, <laughs> I ended up going into artist management um, and I was managing uh, a couple of bands called Decade and Marmoset, who I know you are a fan of. Yeah. And the, basically, they it was at a time when they just didn't have any budget because it was like they'd only just started. They didn't have a label. There was nobody really working with them. 
And obviously I had these sort of like rough knowledge of how PR works. I'd been writing, like I did a bit of writing for like Punktastic and a few other sites as well. So I kind of knew from that side of the fence and a little bit from the PR side. And I was kind of like, well, you can't afford a PR person. So I guess I'll just do it. Like I can write a press release. I know what they're supposed to look like, (laughs) you know? So uh, I just started doing that basically. Um, And it went really well. You know, we just like, we were getting like, national press coverage for them and obviously loads of like blog coverage as well from people like yourself it just got to the point where I was kind of doing it as a favor for other people in bands that I knew and they were like oh well let us give you a bit of money man because like you shouldn't be doing all the work for free you know and then I was kind of like oh probably start making a living out of doing this full time (laughs) if I wanted to you know basically all the stuff with like I did enjoy the promoting, but it's quite an intense like lifestyle, you know. And also, when you're like risking your own money all the time, it's yeah. like you know the gamble of it is like draining. Um, and obviously, you have to work nights and be out late and all that kind of thing. So I was kind of like ready to knock that on the head. The artist management thing, like both of the bands I was working with, like got picked up like by bigger companies and you know bigger labels. And I was kind of like, I won't say I was like bummed about it because obviously it was great to see them do really well, but management you put like so much into it and like yeah there's no unless the band is starting to do really well there's no real like financial reward so it's like you put like your heart and soul into it and then it's kind of like oh the band have like gone somewhere else you know yeah, so, yeah. Just, um so uh, essentially i was kind of like well the pr is going quite well and like you know I'm, it's sort of like that seems to be where my focus is like drawing to so i ended up just kind of taking the leap and doing it essentially yeah um, and i was making like buttons at first you know like luckily i had the, the glasswork job to kind of like that basically the glasswork job paid my rent every month and i was like as long as my rent's paid i can like gamble on how much money i'm gonna make from the pr this month really. <laughs> how much you can you know, eat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that, <laughs> that was essentially my reasoning you know so that's sort of how I got into it, really. And like, like I say, I don't have any formal, you know, uh, qualification or like training or anything. And I've never worked at like another PR company. I just sort of picked up the ropes as I was going. And, you know, I'm sure I made a hell of a lot of mistakes along the way, but you learn from them. And, yeah, you know, and like, obviously, like I say, I've, you know, managed to get friends with a lot of the other PRs um, who a lot of whom I really respect, you know, they've got amazing rosters and amazing careers and, you know, they work with some of the biggest bands in the world. And, you know, obviously you pick up advice and tips from them and, you know, just kind of did it that way really. So yeah, it was a bit of an unorthodox route in. I never really meant to do it. And I didn't, yeah. even, I didn't mean to start a company. Um, didn't mean to be my own boss or have, you know, people working with me or for me. So yeah, it's kind of all. Bad. Just winging it. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Winging it from day one. Yeah, basically. <laughs> well, it's going well for you. Yeah, yeah. So you, you set up Wall of Sound in 2012. Um, what do you think have been like the, like you say, you kind of like learn stuff as you've gone on. What have been like the, the, the biggest hurdles, but also kind of the biggest accomplishments you've kind of met so far? I, I would say the biggest hurdles for me. There's, well, there's two ways. There's internal hurdles and external hurdles, you know. So, like, I'm very sort of uh, self-critical, you know. So I'm sort of like, I always want to try and get the best for, like, our artists, and I always want to do the best job I can. So I'm like, I, I push myself quite hard to, like, get results for people, you know. And, like, yeah. obviously that, that can be difficult, you know, if you're hard on yourself, like, it's a bit sort of draining sometimes. But I think you've just got to keep kind of buoyed up by the wins that you get do you know what i mean that's that's what like really keeps me going you know when we get like bands on radio one or we're getting like you, you know national coverage for our artists or like something's really connecting at blogs and people are like excited about it and you start seeing like the shows are starting to sell out and you know like the band are growing like that's really exciting you know what i mean and it sort of like feeds the passion that i have for for the job you know so like i think you know getting over your kind of like your internal critic is always like it's part of anyone's job really especially when you're self-employed because you don't really have the feedback of like a team or a boss going like oh you did a great job you know you yeah. just sort of like <laughs> you've just you've you got to pat yourself on the back basically yeah you've just <laughs> got to tell yourself yeah Yo, you're doing quite well you know um so that's difficult i mean i think one of the biggest hurdles professionally for us is that we did start out from the ground up from an independent background, you know? So like, obviously if you've worked somewhere else and you've kind of been able to like learn the ropes of someone who knows what they're doing 
and they've like maybe left somewhere they work with like an established roster of like big clients already like obviously you've got a lot more sort of clout behind you yeah. whereas like we've really had to build to that point you know like i feel like we got there and like you know i think we've got a great roster now and we're working with some brilliant you know sort of like big independent labels we've worked with majors before you know we've got some big name clients on the roster now but like it took us a long time to get you know what i mean like you say i've been doing it for like 10 years you know yeah. so like it didn't happen overnight it was a slog you know and i think as with anyone who's you know started a business or works for themselves you know there are times when you're like oh my god i don't know if i can do this anymore you know and you just sort of think like am i even getting anywhere you know but like you've just got to be determined you know like i'm just i'm i think like anyone who knows me would probably say like i <laughs> I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to work for anyone else if I tried. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm very sort of like driven and like focused when I like get in, you know, when I like set my mind to something like I'm, I'm like, I, I know what I want to do and, you know, what I want to achieve and like, I'm going to do it, you know, and I'm going to stick at it until it's done. And like, that's been a massive you know bonus for me. Like, I think you need that, you know, you need, you need that mindset. I think if you're going to, be able to make a success of working for yourself you know yeah like i think you know you've got to you know it's like anyone else like there are days when i don't want to get out of bed you know what i mean like, i'm not interested in doing work today <laughs> like i don't want to do that but like you have to when it's your company you haven't got choice you know you've got yeah. to be there because nobody else is doing the work if you're not so you know you've just got to put the hours in and work hard you know and like that's sort of that's one of the things that's i think helped us overcome like say that hurdle of you know not having the the sort of initial clout is that like I was just really determined and bloody minded that like I was gonna get there and like <laughs> you know we were we were just gonna make a success out of it basically you know yeah so, so what would you say if someone was kind of interested in in venturing into pub- publicity um what would va- advice would you give to to get involved and obviously you kind of covered you kind of went a non-traditional route yourself what advice would you give to someone who was kind of wanting to do it themselves yeah I mean I, I mean you can do it the way I did it you know I mean I mean, for me, it was a kind of like, it was like a necessity thing, you know, I was just sort of like, well, this is here right now and it's an opportunity and I'm just going to pursue it and see what happens. But, you know, I think that's probably also like a a symptom of where I was living at the time and what was available to me in terms of employment. You know, like I say, you know, the majority of the industry is focused in London and, you know, it it wasn't really an option for me to kind of like, I mean, it, 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 it wasn't something I was thinking about, but it wouldn't have been an option for me to like go and do an internship somewhere because like I couldn't afford to do it, you know, and I, I just couldn't have sort of taken that time out really to do it. But obviously that is a route you can take, you know, you, you can speak to uh, other PR companies. I mean, we get inquiries all the time from people about, you know, internships or work experience. And it's something that we have always tried to do as much of as we can. Um, with people obviously it made it a bit difficult in the pandemic because Mm. you can do it remotely but like obviously you want to make sure that you're kind of teaching people properly and like supporting them and like that's kind of hard to do remotely you know if you're not with them all day so I haven't done as much of it recently Um, but I know that loads of you know other PRs and, and companies that we work with you know they're happy to sort of have people in I think to be honest I think like just getting under your own steam um you know like yourselves or any of the other people out there who are kind of bloggers or podcasters or you know doing vlogs and um, photographers you know if you get into that side of things you can very often make connections with PR companies very easily and obviously if you've written a few articles for them over the years <laughs> they're probably going to be more inclined to uh, have you along to do some work experience yeah that's um, true. but you know that's a really good route in i mean to be honest there's loads of support out there as well like there's some amazing um sort of organizations and charities out there that are you know actively supporting people in you know places like youth music we're working with a great label at the moment called both sides records which is um it's part of like brighter sound which they're like this creative music charity based in the north of england and they're basically kind of their remit is is to kind of bring through new music creatives leaders and industry professionals basically from mostly from marginalized communities so there's loads of info out there you know about those kind of organizations that can help but i mean really i just think 
again, you know, I think a lot of the time the people who end up doing it are the people who just, it doesn't really seem an option for them to do anything else. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, you tried to walk away from the blog, Zach. You tried. <laughs> you put your back, your back <laughs> with the podcast because you can't help yourself. You know? That's true. <laughs> I think, you know, you just, something when you love music or, you know, you're passionate about it, I think you're just drawn back to it. And I think, you know, if you kind of see those opportunities, just go for them, you know, don't wait for someone to give you a green light on it. You know, just, but, you know, one of my sort of biggest pieces of advice for anyone who's just getting into PR is like, just take the Hail Mary every time. You know what I mean? Like whenever you think like, oh, I'm just going to give up on this or there's no point in me like pitching that person because they're not going to, go for it just send the email you know what i mean or like pick up the phone because as long as you kind of believe in what you're sort of working on and you've got a good story or you know good music and you're pitching it to the right person who's going to be receptive the worst thing that can happen is they say no you know yeah. what I mean? they're either too busy or, or whatever and um you've just got to be persistent you know you've got to be polite with people and persistent and like it's a great way to get anything in life, really. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you want something, you have to ask for it. You can't sit around and wait for someone to drop it in your lap, really. You know, and it's the same with yeah. if you want to kind of get into PR or any or labels or anywhere else. You know, it's it's a competitive industry at times, and you know, it's kind of quite tight knit, and the opportunities aren't really like there always. And sometimes you have to make your own opportunities. You know, and, and um, it's always worth just asking you know put put yourself on the line and get in touch with people would be yeah. my advice to anyone who wants to get into this side of things for sure yeah i'd say that's the same with obviously journalism as well like if you're trying to pitch articles to whatever publication you're trying to get printed in or obviously on on their site and stuff yeah i say persistence is key just like send the email if they either they don't reply or they say no you're in the same spot you were before you sent the email you know what I mean? yeah absolutely man i mean it's it's one of those like it can be a fine line to tread you know there's always a line of like you don't want to bug people like yeah but like i say if you're polite and you know when to stop <laughs> yeah. then you you'd be surprised you know what i mean like there's there's plenty of times where i've sent someone something and i thought i'll just nudge them on that and then I've kind of thought, oh, I really want to like make sure they saw it, but I don't want to piss them off. And yeah. then I've emailed them what I've just thought, I'll just give it one more go, you know, like, and then they've emailed back and be like, oh, I'm so glad that you emailed me again because like, I just didn't see this and I love it. Or, you know what I mean? And like, they're, yeah. they're the, the moments where you get the piece of coverage over the line that like you might not have got, or, you know, you get the answer about a band being on, on the radio or, you know, on a tour or whatever, like you just got, as long as you're polite and like respectful of people, just ask, you know, keep, yes. keep, keep going. hundred <laughs> percent. When it comes to a, like a band or an artist that wants to sign to, to, you know, you guys or to any PR firm, what is something they kind of need to consider and kind of have in place beforehand before they come? Like, for example, how much time do they need before they want to start running whatever campaign that it is that they want to do? Uh, right. How much money so, are they looking at? Definitely, definitely have some music. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Or, Number yeah, one. Please have some music for us to listen to. I mean, it's okay if bands get in touch with like stuff they've already got out and yeah. they're like, oh, hey guys, we've got a new record coming out next year. Like, we'd really like to work with you. Here's what's already out that's fine and I'll listen to it and I'll go like yeah yeah like you know we like the band and, and what you've got out is good but I'm we're never gonna agree to work on something that we haven't heard unless we already work with the band do you know what I mean like yeah. you know, unless unless we've worked with them already and then they're like oh we've got a new album coming out next year then obviously we'll say yeah fine but I'm I never agree to work on on like a record that I haven't heard and without a track record with a band because for me it's got to be like I have to be passionate about it to, to be able to do my job properly. You know, like we get a lot of submissions that we end up sort of turning away or saying like, this isn't right. Or like, you guys aren't ready yet. Or, you know, the music's good, but we just don't really see like a unique sort of angle on it or a way it can push. You know, I, I've got to really believe in it basically. And like, obviously if I can't hear the music, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, in terms of sending stuff over, I mean, yeah, please God, at least have the music. <laughs> um, 
I mean, to be honest, as much as you can get in advance together is great because, like, the more sort of surrounding stuff we've got around the music to check out, like, you know, if I can see all the artwork, all the press shots, if I can see, like, your touring schedule for the next six to 12 months, I can immediately start going, like, putting a campaign together in my head. You know, I can just go, like, okay, well, this would be great because, like, this video's got this particular narrative or story or look to it and that'll work here and then we can do that you know somewhere else and then we've got these tour dates to like that we can pin something on whereas you know if someone kind of comes and goes like we're thinking about putting a record out we're not really sure what we're going to do and we don't really know what the pictures are going to look like you know you kind of all you've got to go on is the music and like obviously the music is the most important thing but there's so much more to promoting and marketing of you know a record than just the music so yeah yeah i like to have as much of the material and the surrounding stuff as we can have really in terms of like lead-in times it really depends what services you want so like if you wanted us to work on an album like you need to be getting in touch like five months in advance i you know ideally in an ideal world because like long lead print we need to be sending the record out and pitching it for review sort of like three months in advance to print yeah. like, at, at least you know that's tight as well you know for some places if it's like just online pr that can be a bit shorter obviously because you know you don't need the sort of lead-in times for the print process and you know all that kind of thing yeah. um, and it tends to be that to be honest just the turnover of you know how it is the turnover of things online is just so quick that the lifespan is a lot shorter of a record when you when you do an online press for it so that can be kind of like if you if, if they can get in touch like sort of 10 weeks before and give us a good sort of like two month run in on like an ep campaign or something like that that's normally yeah. enough you know and it gives us time to space the singles out and you know put something nice together around it and then radio is probably probably about six weeks something like that per single you know that yeah. would be the sort of release window that we'd look at i mean like with anything though i mean the sooner you can get in touch with us i mean i had a band this morning get in touch with us about that they, they want to do three singles from like september till december at the back end of this year but then they also want to do an EP in like April and then an album in September next year. And like, they've got their whole 18 months planned out, you know, like they're like, yeah, these yeah. are when the releases are, these are when the tours are going to be. We've got these festivals confirmed for next year. So like, that's the, I mean, it, it's very difficult for like unsigned independent bands to put together a schedule like that, that far in advance. But if you can, it's amazing because anyone who you approach is immediately going to go, these guys have got their heads screwed on. They've, they've got a plan they you know they've got everything the bones of everything laid out and it when we've got that on our side of the fence it makes things a lot easier at press and radio as well because you know that's one of the questions that we get asked is the music's really good but like what are they doing next or like you know where where's this going like what's coming after this single so you know if, if we can go back and say oh well actually they're doing this that you know they've got another release coming up then we've got the festivals then it all starts falling into place then you know yeah so, yeah long you know sort of um long answer short i suppose give us as much as you can as early as possible <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and what kind of like financially how, how much do you think like bands should be looking at spending when it comes to well a again that can be sort of how much is a piece of string uh, sorry how long is a piece of string i mean it, it depends what services you're looking at the length of time it can depend sort of how intensively the the either the music or the tour dates need to be pushed i mean for me personally i don't think unsigned independent bands should really be spending more than grand and a half two grand on on a press campaign at the the very early stages you know that would be like absolute mad it's sort of how you know it's the old thing of like you get what you pay for but also Sometimes that's not true, unfortunately. <laughs> so, you know, it's this sort of double-edged... I mean, there are plenty of, like, shady PR people out there, unfortunately. You know, the music industry is full of them. You know, there's shady managers, shady PR people, shady agents. You know, they will work with anyone who gets in touch. They'll take your money, regardless of whether they think your music's good or not. They'll do a crap job on it, and they'll just go like, oh, sorry, but you owe me yeah. 300 quid or whatever. There's also really good people out there who are like drastically undercharging and should be charging more for their services because they're really good at what they do. But that you know, like so, like if you get lucky, you can get a really great PR person for like for the cheap buttons. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But ultimately, what you want is 
is a per- you know the perfect balance is like the band paying a fee that they feel is reasonable and affordable and the person doing the job being able to actually concentrate on doing that job and feeling well compensated for it yeah to the point where they can deliver a really good level of work for the for the client you know so um there are bands who will go to like a top tier you know really expensive like london pr agency and spend like six thousand pounds on the debut ep and i'm just like oh no you know like <laughs> more money than guys, you know because like unfo- you know there are just people out there and like there there are unscrupulous people you know unfortunately and and a lot of artists are naive as well unfortunately you know i mean and you know it's because they're mostly sort of like good nice creative people who don't operate in like the world of business you know yeah yeah like, well one of the things i struggled with when i started doing this is like i'm not really like a natural businessman you know i'm more interested yeah. in like helping people and like the arts and and music and like for me it was it was a, a quite a steep learning curve of like actually this is like a business and you know i need to treat it like a business and yeah but whilst also retaining like an integrity and being fair to clients and, and helping musicians who maybe don't have big budgets, you know, so like I'm, I'm of the opinion that there's definitely a ceiling on what people should spend. There is a sort of like rough, like I say, you know, if you're spending like a grand and a half to sort of two and a half grand, that's probably the right amount on an album campaign. And like, you'll get good service as long as you're using like a reputable company. But again, you know, there's so many ways to approach it now. You know, I mean, like a lot of that, you know, a lot of the budget has kind of like been split between digital marketing now as well, you know. So it might be that a band have like two grand marketing budget for the whole record, but they need to spend some of that on like, you know, Facebook ads or, you know, an email marketing campaign for merch or, you know, whatever. So like, I think more than ever, bands have to be really smart about how they're looking at their PR and marketing budget and, that's something that I discuss with clients when they get in touch, you know, if they say to us like, Oh, you know, like we'd like to do this, but we're not sure, you know, I'll speak to Lee who's, you know, the radio plugger that I work with. And, you know, we'll say, well, look, we maybe think it's like too early for them to do radio on this song. And to be honest, they'd be better spending that money, pushing some ads on Facebook or something like that at this point. Yeah. Um, Or, you know, doing stuff through Instagram or wherever. And then maybe we'll come back on the next single and, and do that, you know, instead to radio. So I think a good PR person should discuss your sort of um, overall strategy and your marketing budget and spend with you and be transparent really is the answer to that question. You know, yeah. like you can kind of, it's one of those, you know, you can spend as much as you want. If someone comes to us and says, we've got, three thousand pounds and we just want to do this 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 and this we want to plug all these singles we want to do five months of pr on this like if that's really what they want we'll do it but i'll say to them guys i don't think you should do that <laughs> i think you, should, you know i think you should yeah. maybe look at doing this instead or that i mean some pr people probably won't thank me for saying that but like that's that's how we do things you know that's, yeah. that's how we talk to clients so yeah and what about um i mean in terms of realistic expectations from a band i mean i imagine there are some bands that you know this is like their first pr campaign they think you know if i pay you this much to do this you've got the magic key to give me you know tv coverage we're going to be famous you know but we're set for life here like what kind of expectations do you think a band should be having when it goes to going into a pr campaign mm. yeah i get well that's a really good question again zach i mean i think i always say to people like you can't look at press as like um bit PR press I mean um as like a a magic bullet you know like it's not a case of if we throw money at this it's going to work the PR person really is only as good as what they've got to work with really you know so like obviously a great record is a massive chunk of that you know like if we've got a great record with fantastic music that's great you know that's perfect starting point but we also need all the surrounding stuff and if we don't have I'm not saying you need like a label and an agent and all that kind of thing, but you have to be realistic about the fact that if it's just one person that you've hired to shout into the void, <laughs> there's a hundred thousand albums out this Friday. Honestly, this one's really good. Do you know what I mean? Even, <laughs> yeah. even if it's just like, even if you're the most trusted best PR person in the country, who's got the best hookups with all the magazines, you're going to be up against it, you know, because like what you're up against is like other bands who, 
have a great record but are also on tour with Slipknot that month or do you know what I mean and like yeah. there's, there's, there's more parts to it than just here's a great record please cover it you know so I think you know one of the things that I always say I always ask clients have they worked with PR companies before what's their experience of it you know what what are they hoping to get out of the campaign because if they say to me oh actually yeah we've got a bit of experience um or even if they don't have experience but they say you know we know how it works and like we understand that like you know this is the level we're at and this is what we can expect and you know they you know if they come back and they're like you know what we'd really be happy with is like a really good like sort of online sort of um grassroots level support at some blogs you know maybe like start edging into some titles like Kerrang and stuff with some small pieces or like a review to me that shows someone who understands like the level they're at but yeah. you know sometimes you speak to someone and they're like we want you know the Kerrang front cover next week <laughs> you're like well <laughs> what's what's going on with the band because like that's yeah. not how it it might appear to people that that's how it works it's not how it works you know even when it's like major label artists they can't just unlock the marketing budget and go like we'll have everything like yeah. tomorrow you know like because they're up against all the people who are also vying for the same coverage and positions you know so yeah. there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it so yeah i mean understanding what you're likely to get for like what you're bringing to the table and weighing up whether that is worth financially the position you're in to a band is definitely a discussion to have you know if you're thinking about pr because again you know i've had people get in touch with records where i've thought like it's good but it's not quite at the level where it would like stand up against competition if you like i don't really like to use that word because i don't like looking at music as a competition but you know what i mean when you're spying for the same stuff so like you know we we look at those records and i would often email people back and say like guys honestly i think you'd be better spending this money on like going back in the studio or just like spend some more time in the practice room writing more or you know spend it on touring or whatever so like you've got to weigh up whether it's like the right time definitely you know i mean like there'll there'll be a point where you'll you'll know you know you'll go like these are our really really strong songs like things are going well it feels like a good time we've kind of gone as far as we can go on our own we need some help now you know to me that's the point where someone else should should get in touch but there's a lot that you can do yourself you know if you're motivated people you can get a lot of like yeah you know i'm sure when you were doing dead press you you would get loads of unsigned and independent bands get in touch as well as prs i imagine you know and like if you're driven enough and you have the time and the skills to do it yourself i would always recommend take it as far as you can yourself you know what i mean like if you if you sort of know what you're doing a little bit and are confident doing it don't spend the money until you need to you know yeah. when you need to that's when you'll see the results that you're hoping for you know because a lot of the time people will come in at the ground floor with nothing going on and like you say expect the world and it's just not how it works it's not going to happen you know even we are going to have to build a a band from the ground up you know we're going to have to start small and and, and build up and you know it's not something that happens overnight you know like I say you know we have take a long-term view to working with people and it can take years to build a band you know can literally you know can take some bands 10 years before they get to the point where it's you know viable or you know sort of a success in inverted commas but longer even you know so you've got to take a, a sort of um reasonable long-term view on things as well i think i think as well if a band does go kind of diy at least like in the beginning and you know make those connections themselves they're then building relationships with people in the industry which is you know part and parcel and, and you know integral to any kind of role you've got in the industry like a journalist you gotta make connections publicist make connections band make connections it's all about connections and relationships really yeah absolutely it's absolutely you know the whole industry is, is like that really you know we work with bands now still who we've been working with them for a long time but they might happen to for whatever reason just have a really good personal connection with you know a particular dj or a writer or someone and like i'm of the opinion that you know the way i like to work is like if they've got a good personal connection with them they should continue that relationship you know what's there's no point in me kind of like get like sandwiching myself in the middle and you know yeah. play, like playing the middleman for no yeah. reason it's like i i like to work quite collaboratively with people you know so like obviously i've got a really good contacts book that i've built up over the years but if someone else has got like a better hook up with someone 
and they're more likely to kind of like get the win or get something over the line then go for it you know so I, yeah i'm all for kind of bands doing as much networking themselves as they can because i think a lot of people make the mistake of um taking a very hands-off approach to like the whole process you know once they start getting professionals in and unfortunately it's it's how you get to the point of like you know those those kind of bands that get to like the mid level on festivals and then like you think they're doing really well and like they seem to be playing everywhere and everything's going really well and they're on their like third album and then all of a sudden they've split up and you're yeah. like oh why has that happened it's normally because they've got absolutely no idea what's going on with like the business of their band you know and mm. like they've got no like it, all of a sudden they go oh hang on we've got no money our band's not profitable this wasn't promoted in the way we wanted it to be or you know our manager has like dropped the ball on something or like you know and that unfortunately that happens when you don't take an interest in like your career which is what it is you know like yeah. you have to look at it as like i mean it's fucking loads of fun being in a band believe me, it's loads of fun <laughs> you can't get distracted by like that side of it too much either you know you do have to like think like this is my career and like i'm invested in making sure that we've got the right people working for us that they're doing a good job that we've got like a good reputation with people that you know like you have to keep an eye on that side of things you know i think a lot of bands make the mistake of taking their eye off that you know they kind of think like their job is to write record and then everyone else does their jobs and to well, extent, I mean, it should, like, in in a lot of ways like that is the way it should be you know like that that is their job you know that's why we're here you know to yeah. take that that sort of pressure off people but like I'll tell you right now, like I wouldn't hire someone to look after my bank account and then never check what they were doing. With yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. bands do that all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would, I would not do that, you know? Um, and I know, you know, I won't name any names, but I know like a lot of, especially like big bands who are doing quite well, who are like very involved in the finance, you know, like they, they go to like all the band members go to like all the meetings with the accountant and the manager. And they're very like, they keep an eye on stuff do you know what i mean yeah. because you, you need to like it's you know at the end of the day it's your livelihood and your music and you know it's one of those weird industries where like you know the artist and the music is the the product in inverted commas which i hate saying but it, it is you know yeah com- from a commercial point of view and like everyone around an artist is getting paid and the artist is like the last person to get any money do you know what yeah. i mean so like you better make sure that these people are doing a damn good job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you yeah. want you want the right people around you who are like who care about you and aren't going to take advantage of you, basically. You know, and like I think it's really important to keep an eye on that and try and stay grounded and like connected to to who you're working with and why and what's going on. You know, because there's a believe me, there's a huge amount of like unfortunate stories. You know that that we come across all the time with people. So like, yeah, you've got. Unfortunately, like it, the rumors about the music industry are true. That <laughs> all of a lot of really, really good people, but there are also some unfortunately really like destructive people in uh, out there that you know that you've got to try and avoid. Really, you know, plenty of snakes, basically. Mm. Yeah, sadly, sadly. But yeah. like I say, loads of good people as well. You know. In terms of you know you, you're talking there about obviously the business side of things and keeping an eye on things talk about your business wall of sound what's kind of like the plan for the foreseeable like we mentioned earlier obviously you've been going for 10 years now what's what's next what's what are you hoping to achieve in the foreseeable yeah i mean I it's one of those things where like obviously i i think about it and you know we we have a sort of um i have like an idea of what i'd like the you know the company to to become in the future but i'm very cautious of like not over extending as well you know because like i say we are we are like only a small company and like i really like working for myself i'm not so mad about like being the boss or you know it's not really i don't really want to have like a massive company with loads of people working for me you know i like keeping it small i like it that it's personal i like that we're approachable and we can just spend a lot of time with with clients and you know we we get to know people well and it has that kind of like family feel to it so i really like that having said that obviously that comes with limitations you know there's a limit on how much stuff we can work on so it's always for me it's always that balance of like obviously i want the company to like grow but for me it's not like i don't have like a huge master plan of like we want to make loads of money and the company's got to be massive and like you know it's not really what it's about for me 
So in terms of like where I see it going, I mean, really, I'd just like to keep adding like really quality stuff to the roster, really. You know, like I'd love to work with some more bigger labels and bands like we've been doing recently. You know, I mean, Alcapop signed the Subways recently, which was great because that's, you know, that's a really big name for us. Yeah. Um, and like, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we started working with Epitaph now, which is great. And we've done some stuff with um, some Sony imprints and, you know, various other sort of major label subsidiaries recently, which has been really good, you know, because it's kind of like, I like to be able to balance bringing through like the totally unsigned new bands with working on sort of more established, bigger names, because obviously it's great to have those, those artists on the roster, but it also helps us when we're bringing through the new bands to have yeah. that kind of leverage, you know, from, from those bigger artists as well. So yeah, just, just to kind of keep on the lookout for, for new avenues of, of business really and like at least been doing great on the radio side of stuff like because we only um we've always done radio plugin but we've never had like a dedicated uh service for it so like yeah. how we used to do things with me and lee would have our own rosters of like bands and we do everything for all of those bands whereas now i do all the online and print stuff and lee does all the radio and because he's like full-time doing radio all day every day he's obviously made loads of great connections with you know producers and and djs and we're starting to see like real pickup in like the amount of like radio one and six music and radio x and you know international plays as well we start to get like playlists for bands so that side of things is going great and the online and print with me being able to dedicate more time to that as well has really picked up and you know we've been getting a lot of high profile stuff recently so i think really just kind of going in that direction like i will probably look at some point i think we're gonna have to take at least one extra publicist on i think probably in the near future but like again i don't want it to get too big and it has to be like the right person for me as well you know i care a lot about like the ethos of the company really you know in terms of like I really want it to be like artist focused and I want us to be well respected and transparent and, you know, approachable. And our reputation means a lot to me, you know, so it yeah. has to be like Lee I've known for years. And like, I really got on with him when we met and I respected him and, you know, he had the same approach to things as me, you know, likewise with Chris who he recently left, unfortunately, but, you know, we were very, he, he was like a really good fit for like the ethos of the company and he really believed in like the ethics and like the core values of it. And that's really important for me, you know? So for me, like that is more important than like relentlessly expanding the company. You know, I, I care more about like what we're working on and, and who we're working with really. So in terms of a plan, I don't have one like with everything else. <laughs> Just winging it. That's the plan to wing it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider supporting the podcast in any way that you can. We have a Patreon where you can get access to each episode a week early, along with some other perks, a merch store, a Discord community, or you can leave a review wherever you're listening to this. You can also follow me on social media or subscribe to the newsletter where I'll send out each episode to you via email, along with regular playlists. All of this can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's it's not a phase dot co dot uk thanks again for listening and remember it's not a phase it's a lifestyle <laughs>